The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. Welcome to Books Against the Modern Errors on the Restoration Radio Network. I'm Stephen Heiner, and I'm joined, as always, by my guest, His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn, Rector of Most Holy Trinity Seminary in Brooksville, Florida. Your Excellency, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. This is one of those days when I, I realized that uh, being in Florida in January is, is a very good thing. It was uh, not nearly as warm here today uh, in my neck of the woods. Well, the sun is out. And it's about uh, 65. It's on the cool side today. <laughs> <laughs> on the cool side. <laughs> uh, um, it's a beautiful today's episode, today's episode, episode one, is uh, going to be on Merari Vos by uh, His Holiness Pope Gregory the Sixteenth. Christmas, you mentioned this in our introductory show as, as an encyclical you consider important or your favorite. and before we get to the meat of the encyclical, Gregory the Sixteenth is a little further removed uh, from us, and and some people are more used to hearing about Pius X or Pius XI, Pius XII, the more recent popes. Can you tell us a little bit about this pope and assess his papacy in brief? And for those who aren't familiar with your uh, phrasing, they haven't watched your video series on True Restoration Media. Shameless plug on on the pendulating papacy uh, accommodation and anti-accommodation. Could you could you just put that together in a nutshell for us? The assessment of Gregory the Sixteenth papacy, where did he fall in the pendulum? And and then we can get right into the encyclical from there. Uh, yes, just a little background on pendulating papacy. The by the eighteenth century, the effects of the Protestant Reformation were becoming m- much more felt in Europe, and not only in those areas that had gone over to Protestantism, but what was much more alarming was that they were these ideas were making inroads into the attitudes and culture of Catholics, notably the rise of the encyclopedists and the philosophers of the 18th century, who essentially did not believe in anything, and they were atheists and agnostics. And this was influencing Catholic countries, these ideas, and, and especially Catholic rulers. So you had the court of Louis XV, the, the Spanish court, Charles VI, uh, if I'm not mistaken on that number, Joseph II in Austria, uh, the, the uh, Kingdom of Naples. All of these big Catholic kingdoms were infected in the 1700s with liberalism and what uh, philosophism, that is, the, the, uh, the new ideas which were uh, inimical to the Catholic faith. So the, the problem was, how do we deal with this? Uh, the, the courts of Europe in the 18th century were demanding, essentially, schism from the Catholic Church. They were demanding that the Church in their various countries be subject practically totally to the monarch, where the Pope would be uh, something like a Queen Elizabeth, uh, somebody in Rome that uh, uh, gave a a certain external unity to Catholicism, but where the the bishops of the various countries would be on their own to function uh, as the arbiters of the religion in their own countries and subject to the monarch and appointed by the monarch. Uh, This was known as regalism, and and that's where there was a a two-party system that grew up among the cardinals. This might be a little shocking. Uh, We're not used to that in the the church. We're used to it in our country, but not in the church. There was a two-party system based on two different ideas of how to deal with this problem. And one party was called the 
Zelanti in Italian, badly translated as zealots in English. They were the zealot has a very negative con- connotation. It just means the zealous, we might say, uh, in Italian. And the other party was known as the politicanti, that is, the politicizers. And the Zelanti uh, felt that the church should not make compromises with these hostile governments that were infected with Jansenism and all sorts of anti-clericalism and anti-Romanism, uh, that the church should hold out and, and bear what it has to bear, but it cannot make shameful compromises with these people. Uh, that, that, that That's like throwing chickens to hungry alligators. And the problem with that is that, well, the alligator might be uh, satisfied for a time, but then he'll come back and look for more chickens. And the uh, on the other side was the politicanti who said, no, the, the best interests of the church are served by giving in to these requests as much as we can without sacrificing anything essential, but uh, that, that uh, we're going to uh, expose the church to all sorts of uh, terrible things and persecution. We will lose the ability to, uh, the, the hold over culture. You see, the, 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 the Catholic Church very much wants to be established in countries in order that there be a Catholic culture. And so the politicanti would argue, well, you're going to have a, an open persecution of the church. They might throw out the bishops. They might throw out the religious orders. And then the people are without any priests at all any bishops at all. And this is what you're risking. So both sides had an argument, and both sides thought we have to uh, pursue the best interests of the church. So, you know, I'm not necessarily, I mean, I have my, of course, <laughs> I would I would have belonged to the Zelanti party, no doubt. And I think history has proven the Zelantis to be correct. But uh, I'm not throwing rocks at the politicanti in saying that they were evil or that they intended hard things for the church. They, they, were, they all of, were of good intention, and they just had a different idea of what the prudential course should be. So in the 18th century, you, you, uh, have this, you, you see a swing back and forth with each uh, election going back and forth between a zelante and a politicante. So you start out, if we take Benedict XIV, as a, as a politicante, and extremely so. Uh, in the 1750s, he's succeeded by a Clement XIII, who is a, a Zelante. He's anti uh, all of the developments of the 18th century. He condemns the Encyclopedia of Diderot. Uh, then he is followed by a Clement XIV, who is very politicante, he, at the behest of the Bourbon monarchies, uh, which is Naples, Spain, and France, suppresses the Jesuits. The Jesuits being the one great holdout against all of the evil and, and rotten ideas of the 18th century. Uh, they had control of all of the Catholic schools in those countries. So they get suppressed. And uh, so he dies in 1774. Uh, or three or four, uh, and uh, he is succeeded by Pius VI, who is a Zelante, and and uh, a mild form of it, however, but nonetheless a Zelante, and uh, he he opposes all of these things and, and uh, actually favors the Jesuits in certain cases, uh, permitting them to exist in Prussia and in Russia. And then he is followed by a very extreme, uh, in 1800, by a very extreme politicante, and that is Pius VII, Pius VII, who dealt with the French Revolution and Napoleon in such a way that, that, that he was very, very conciliationist or, or conciliatory with Napoleon, who was a Freemason and who actually had declared himself a Muslim and denied that God had a, uh, a son when he was in Egypt. And uh, nonetheless, he, he dealt very, very favorably with him. And in doing that, enraged uh, the, most of the College of Cardinals, enraged them. And uh, so in 1823, when he died, Leo XII was elected, a, a very strong, talante, anti 
liberal, anti um, uh, French Revolution, and everything that came out of it. Uh, he reigned for seven years, and then right after him, back again you go to Pius VIII, Castiglioni was his name. He's very uh, liberal and, for the age, and very uh, he's a politicante, and was elected as such. Then we come to Gregory the Sixteenth in 1832, I think it was. He is elected, and he is a very, very strong delante. All right, so he is <laughs> more than anyone so far. He is. Uh, he was a Camaldolese monk, and he is very, very much against all of the modern developments. So that's where we are. I mean, I could go on with the the rest of it uh, right up to Pius the Twelfth and Pius uh, and John the Twenty Third, if you want. But that's where we are in in that pendulation uh, of the papacy. No, and I think that feeds well into into the first paragraph and my first question. So we'll be talking about the the encyclical. You can find it as I as I said in the introductory episode for free on the internet, or you can find it in that book that we alluded to, the Popes Against Modern Errors, which is our uh, the namesake of our show. So you're actually in paragraph one and paragraph two. Um, His Holiness writes. If the right hand of God had not given us strength, you would have drowned as the result of the terrible, terrible conspiracy of impious men. And in paragraph two, uh, their unbridled rage seemed to grow from continued impunity and our considerable indulgence. So you set us up by telling us that Gregory the Sixteenth was a strong uh, Zelanti anti-accommodationist. Who? Yeah. What is he talking about there? He's talking about the effluent of the French Revolution. The French Revolution was a, a, an explosion of the philosophy, that's in quotation marks, of the 18th century, which was essentially agnosticism, liberalism, atheism, blatant anti-Catholicism. And this was installed throughout all of Europe, all of these attitudes, by Napoleon. He conquered all of Europe, and he brought with it all of this effluent of the French Revolution, all of the new ideas of the 18th century, uh, a revolt against the church. Is, then in 1814, he, is, uh, he loses, uh, not Waterloo, but he loses, uh, France is invaded by the Allies. He is deposed, he's sent to Elba, and uh, he makes an attempt one year later to come back, which is exactly 200 years ago, and is defeated in 1815 at Waterloo. Then there is what is known as the Restoration, and everything was restored. That is, all of the old monarchies were restored, and all of the nobility and the aristocracy. Everything was restored except the church. The church did not get a single bit of its property back in any of those countries, all of which was confiscated. Didn't get a, a penny back. And also, in the constitutions of those countries, you have the rise of what is known as religious liberty, that, that the church is not established as the state religion, or at least if it is, there is also granted religious liberty to non-Catholic sects. This is what is on the rise at this time. You also have on the rise uh, the old Gallicanism, which is the old regalism, that is the interference of the kings and emperors with the church that we already talked about. So, you know, back come the kings and back come all of their bad ideas and bad practices that the church has to deal with. So already Leo XII in the 1820s was complaining to King Louis XVIII of all of these things, that here you have, uh, you put on the same level Catholicism and non-Catholic sects in France, and also you are interfering with all of the mechanisms of the church. You are doing essentially all of the things that that you know we had to face in the 18th century, and you know essentially please stop. Uh, uh, so that was a, he wrote a, a lengthy letter to Louis the 18th complaining of all of those things. There was a figure, however, in France, and this will be what will precipitate Mirari Vos. There was a priest in France by the name of Félicité de Lamennais. He was the most popular priest in France. Everybody knew who he was. Uh, you, you, could be, you could compare him maybe to Father Coglin in the 1930s. 
uh, he was very well known, and he was the champion of liberalism. That is, that the best situation for the church is to have a free church in a free state, where the state says nothing to the church and the church says nothing to the state, and where you have freedom of religion. And something like the, exactly like the situation in the United States today, where the United States says nothing to the church. I mean, it's completely hands off. And that, uh, uh, that this is the ideal state in which uh, the church should uh, exist and what the church should call for, an, an indifferent state or, or uh, you know, one in which there is absolutely no contact or communication between church and state. And this was why Gregory the Sixteenth issued Mirari Vos because he was very influential, and he was condemned by Gregory the Sixteenth, and he eventually died impenitent. Uh, many years later, he he was stunned by the condemnation, and uh, died impenitent and outside of the church. So Gregory the Sixteenth is addressing this rise of liberalism among Catholics that this is something that has to be corrected, this idea that that the ideal state of the world is one which is indifferent to religion and which the Catholic faith is not seen as the one true faith. And also he's, he's addressing in a general way all of the other isms of the 19th century, the uh, rise of um, general irreligion and also uh, Freemasonic sects the rise of the Carbonari and, and other groups in Italy that were uh, attempting to overthrow the Church. Most Catholics don't realize how much the the Church lost in the French Revolution and how much of a, a seismic shift there was in the thinking of peoples uh, from before the Revolution to after with regard to the establishment of religion. For example, as late as the 1780s, there were two young men that had to flee France because they desecrated a crucifix, and they would have been prosecuted and put to death for that. That's, that's how much the Catholic faith was established in France, even as late as the 1780s. That law of sacrilege was done away with by Louis XVIII in the new constitution. So-called restoration. Yes, and, and then Charles X in the 1820s restored it, and that was one of the reasons why he was run out by the... Um, 1830 revolution, they wanted a liberal king, that was Louis Philippe. And now don't forget, Gregory the Sixteenth is coming in 1832, right on the heels of this. So he is seeing France in a type of new revolution, that is a revolution against the, the union of church and state. Uh, he's seeing France becoming a secularist, indifferentist place. And this is also going on in the rest of Europe. I mean, it's not only France, he's not only talking Well, this about is the beginning of the France of Charlie Hebdo. Absolutely. Uh, the the uh, I just uh, I don't know if you saw my you probably you didn't. I wrote about this. Uh, the reason, if I could just do a footnote on Charlie Hebdo. Wait, are you are you saying this was in your seminary newsletter? Yes, I did, it just came out. Uh, and we just want to uh, remind, the, remind our listeners that you can get a copy of the seminary newsletter. Normally, as we always say, it's a donation of seventy five dollars. Uh, but for our Restoration Radio listeners, it can be for two hundred dollars. If you make a donation to the seminary, you can get a copy of the newsletter. Sorry to interrupt, Director. Please, please tell us what you wrote about. Yes, uh, it, it very much is connected with this, and that is what was under attack in France was not uh, just any old newspaper. And really, you know, that 12 people were killed, as much as that is a, a tragedy in itself, it wasn't a 9 11. It wasn't the crashing down of two skyscrapers and 3,000 people killed. And you know, you say, why all of this outrage because of an act of terrorism? London was hit, you know, a few years before with acts of terrorism. Moscow was hit with acts of terrorism. Remember all of those children that died in the southern part of Russia. Madrid was hit on a; they were bombed on a train a number of years ago. I mean, Europe has seen terrorism. Why? Why is there an outrage? Why is there a procession of world leaders? Uh, by the way, which was only a photo op. I don't know if you know that, but the uh, well, well yeah. that's another footnote. But the the uh, why all of this this sensitivity and and outrage over this act of terrorism, relatively minor. And the reason is, in my opinion, is that what was 
attack there was not just any newspaper, but the the atheism of France and the apostasy of France was attacked there. That France is a place in which you can make fun of religion. And by that, I'm not trying to defend Islam. I'm saying that newspaper made fun of every religion, including the Catholic religion. Yeah, unspeakable. And, uh, and, uh, yes, the, they showed the three persons of the Blessed Trinity in one of their cartoons as three people having sodomitic sexual relations. That's how evil that thing was. It was the devil's den that, that Charlie Hebdo, and still is. So they, as I say in my newsletter, they were performing the violence of making fun of and ridiculing religion. Uh, I, I, I say that you know, violence is not only at the end of the barrel of a gun. You can do violence by ridiculing people, and especially ridiculing what they consider to be sacred. And so the, the, the Islamics, the terrorists, responded with violence, and I'm not trying to justify that, but these people were asking for it, and and the the what was offensive to France was that its right to make fun of religion and to to strip it and to 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 say the most dreadful and evil things which come straight out of the revolution all of the evil of the revolution that is what was struck by those uh, by those uh, Muslims and that's why there was uh, all of the sensitivity to it and just you know footnote number two there was that famous picture of all of those European leaders walking as if in front of the great crowd. They were not walking in front of the great crowd. If you see an overhead picture, there's probably 75 people in that group who are walking along for a photo op. They were not at the head of the great crowd of people. That was just a, a one more propaganda uh, scheme, that's all. Anyway, it was a, it was, so where are we now? Was, Bring yeah. me back to where well, I was talking. About. No, well, I, I want. I, I'm. I'm glad you addressed it, yours. I want to address that in uh, in paragraph 15 when we talk about the free press. I think it'll be an excellent time to go back. I, I do want to talk about Charlie Hebdo a little bit more, but I actually, uh, His Holiness, um, was prescient here. Uh, you could summarize uh, the the world of Charlie Hebdo by the end of paragraph five, where he says, "Indeed, this great mass of calamities had its inception in the heretical societies and sects." in which all that is sacrilegious, infamous, and blasphemous has gathered as bilge water in a ship's hold, a congealed mass of all filth. Now, yes. because I, I'm not as familiar with the sermons of Gregory the Sixteenth, when I hear bilge water and filth, I normally think this is something this is a Bishop Sanborn sermon. So <laughs> if you ever if you think about, you know, you want to get insight into where people's intellectual sources are it's clear that His Excellency has read this encyclical numerous times, and then it's gone into his subconscious, because then he'll say words like bilge water, and you'll think, where did that come from? Did His Excellency serve on a, on a boat somewhere? And you think, nope, he read Murari Vos just one too many times, and this comes out. But I think it's an excellent visual, isn't it? Bilge water. This is yeah. what this is. And it's intellectual, so people, people can't see it. It's their ideas. They're floating out in space. But uh, His Holiness gives us this this view. It says, "No, this is what it is. It's disgusting." I see. I might have a slightly different translation, but I, I see him describe it as an abyss of bottomless miseries, which these conspiring societies have especially dug, in which heresy and sects have, in uh, so to speak, vomited, as in a sewer, all that their bosom holds of license, sacrilege, and blasphemy. How Ooh. very true. It could not have been said better. And, and you can see what is on his mind, that this liberalism is going to destroy everything that the Catholic faith has built up. It's going to make savages out of human beings and give us a world that, that we cannot live in. He's writing in 1832. I mean, he might as well be writing in 2015. Yes. I mean, I, you know, we think, we think, really, were things so bad? back then, but be, it was because it, it was so close to the revolution that the blood in the streets and the murders of the clergy, it was fresh in the mind. And so I suppose that abhorrence was right then and there, very clearly seen. But I, I, we can read that translation and have that same sensibility now. 
Um, it doesn't sound like anything's changed. In fact, it's the, the bilge water is probably turned into just bilge mud at this point. Uh, there, there's no water in it anymore. Well, I would say this too, that the, these pontiffs see the logical conclusions of all of these movements. What may seem to be uh, like a nice thing for the church, that the church no longer has to deal with these uh, these monarchs who interfere, and there would be a sort of an air of freedom, and everyone would would feel better about it. The, that's the way these things were were presented at the time. These pontiffs are so insightful that they see the the evil in those movements, and they see the ultimate uh, conclusions. And that's why they are condemning them so strongly. Uh, and it's to their credit because, uh, you know, he's a prophet. Here we are almost 200 years later, and, and all of this is coming true. Well, I want to address this, uh, this point that I was interested in, he, getting to paragraph 10, uh, because we addressed in our introductory episode uh, that in encyclical infallibility depends on, on what it's addressing. Uh, you say we wouldn't, properly speaking, say that all encyclicals are infallible. It, it depends on its content and what the content is addressing. In paragraph 10, he's addressing the papal authority over canonical decrees. What was the specific context of this? Why did uh, the Holy Father feel he needed to address this? The interference of governments in with regard to enacting papal decrees uh, that the government may refuse to publish in in a specific area or a specific country things that that the Pope has decreed, and so it paralyzed the papacy because it could not communicate with its bishops, could not communicate with its people, uh, and don't forget this was before the internet. So that the government could effectively stop anything it wanted to. So he, he's he's asserting his influence and his, his authority over people who would would stop the pope from from exerting his his authority. In, in right after that, in paragraphs eleven and twelve, we see um, that the Holy Father has to defend uh, once again clerical celibacy and the indissolubility of marriage. Again, ripped from today's headlines. Uh, we could say plus de change, plus de c'est la même chose. Um, you know, it's not new. The attack on clerical celibacy and the attack on marriage, it's not new. And here it is, 1832, he's having to spend time in encyclical uh, defending it. It must be because it was under attack at that time. Yes, everything was under attack. Everything was under attack. And uh, he is uh, uh, saying that uh, it must be taught that uh, marriage is indissoluble. The revolutionaries and liberals were calling for a divorce in nations that never knew divorce, and uh, they were calling for a complete secularization uh, of society uh, and uh, a, a dumping, essentially, of all of the laws of the Catholic Church. Uh, yes, and of course, clerical celibacy. This is all stuff from the 18th century, though. I mean, this, this is all hangovers from the 18th century uh, philosophers, as they were called, uh, who uh, wanted to see a, a completely liberalized church. The the motto, by the way, of Felicite de Lamene, who is the occasion of this encyclical, was Catholicize liberalism and liberalize Catholicism. If you want, in 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 those words, like in a little little motto, all of Vatican II. There it is. Catholicized liberalism. That is, uh, the church wants to go to the liberal, secularistic world that is represented by all of this bilge water and say, we want you to have a spiritual dimension to your betterment of man. That's Gaudium et Spes. That we will be with you in this humanistic approach to the betterment of man. Think of Paul VI telling the UN, you know, you're the last hope of the world. See, we, we want to be with you, but we criticize you in as much as you do not have a spiritual dimension. And liberalize Catholicism, that is, make Catholicism something that is acceptable to this world. Essentially, make Catholicism, it's a terrible image, but make Catholicism into a prostitute. 
that is something that will be acceptable to this modern world that does have a daily dose of the bilge water uh, to make up the church in such a way as to make it attractive. That is Vatican II. Catholicized liberalism and liberalized Catholicism. That is Vatican II. That is the horror that we're living in. And it comes from the very man that was condemned by this encyclical, Felicité de Lamene, and he is just a, uh, you know, it wasn't like as if it sprang from one man. He was just a, at the, the the spearhead, we might say, of a whole movement of this attitude that the Catholic Church has to, in some way, compromise with the modern world in order to make itself acceptable. That is, they were known as the liberal Catholics in the 19th century. It's, it's accommodationism gone wild. And that's exactly what happened at Vatican II, that if we continue to keep the church in the Middle Ages and, and in the Tridentine period, and if we continue to just call councils to condemn modern errors, no one will listen to the Catholic Church anymore, and the Catholic Church will die on the vine, and people will no, no longer pay attention to it. We know the rest of the story. After 50 years, <laughs> the precise opposite has happened. That is, by liberalizing Catholicism, no one pays attention to it. And it, the world is not interested in Catholicizing liberalism, uh, giving liberalism a, a spiritual dimension. That means, it, that proof of that is that there's no Bergoglio effect. That is, by liberalizing Catholicism and, and actually suggesting that sodomy is okay, that that is not bringing back people into the Novus Ordo churches. They have no interest in that thing. Well, they well, have contempt fair, for, the, for the for the liberalized bilge Catholicism. Is the most, bilge water isn't the most exciting thing to look at. So <laughs> right. You can't, can't really blame the people for leaving the Novus Ordo. As we get into paragraphs 13 through 19, I think this is where someone like myself who was raised in the Novus Ordo, we start to see this real blurring because while we may not have heard something exactly along these lines, I think it was implied by some of our lay teachers. It was implied in some of the catechisms that we had. Even in, uh, I came from a conservative Novus Ordo uh, family and background. Even some of those texts, we would run into this. So I'll start with paragraph 13. Second sentence, this perverse opinion is spread on all sides by the fraud of the wicked who claim that it is possible to obtain the eternal salvation of the soul by the profession of any kind of religion, as long as morality is maintained. That sounds pretty good uh, for, for modern man. Later on, uh, His Holiness quotes St. Augustine by saying, therefore, without a doubt, they will perish forever unless they hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. So the world's opinion and our Lord's opinion uh, countered right in that paragraph. Yes, the, the, the modern world wants to seek the perfection of mankind, first by denying original sin, and secondly saying that uh, it can achieve its salvation, what uh, uh, most people would say, peace and harmony among nations. Some people might put a spiritual aspect on it and say, go to heaven. Uh, by merely being naturally good. That means by the practice of natural virtue, uh, not supernatural virtue. Supernatural virtue is love of God, uh, supernatural charity, which demands supernatural faith, which demands adherence to Catholic dogmas. So the, uh, the Church's teaching is that mankind cannot for a long time, persevere in natural virtue without the help of actual grace. He might retain some natural virtues, but he cannot persevere in all of the natural virtues for a long time without the help of grace. In other words, he cannot achieve his perfection without the help of grace. He falls necessarily into sin. And don't forget, man was never in a completely natural state. He falls necessarily into sin without the help of grace. So that means that the, everything morally collapses without the help of grace. And people become savages. They become grossly immoral, as we have seen in the history of the world. 
uh, adoring things that, that are, are absurd to adore, even advanced civilization. They become totally mixed up about who God is and, and, and what his attributes are. Then as mankind just collapses and, and, and falls down as a result of being cut off from supernatural grace. But the modern world wants to perfect man without grace, without the church, without the Savior. And that, that's, that's the, the whole spirit of the modern world. And the church is saying, no, you need the, the, uh, you need the faith, you need supernatural charity, you need all of these things that come to us from the Catholic Church, and unless you adhere to these, these things that, that are proposed by the Catholic Church, you will go to hell. And that, that's the, the teaching of the Church. So there is a, uh, an extremely deep and absolute opposition between the modern world and the Church. Uh, and that's why Vatican II is so significant, is that it, it wants to somehow blend these two things. It wants to blend the naturalism of the modern world uh, with the, the supernatural faith and, and charity of the Church as if those two things could somehow be put together. They cannot. Uh, they, they are absolutely opposed. And, and we have seen the result. Uh, an absurd religion that they call the Novus Ordo. Mm. Uh, that is, in, is running out of steam as we speak. In paragraph 14, well, it, it's going to run out of steam even slower if people aren't uh, reproducing like rabbits, I suppose, uh, <laughs> to, to, to keep it going. In, in paragraph 14, um, his, his Holiness continues this idea of taking what's out there abstract and intellectual and giving us a very strong visual image. He starts paragraph 14 by saying, the shameful font of indifferentism gives rise to that absurd and erroneous proposition, which claims that liberty of conscience must be maintained for everyone. Again, again modern man says, well, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And then his Holiness, uh, continues at the end of the paragraph by saying, thence comes transformation of minds, corruption of youth, contempt of sacred things and holy laws. In other words, a pestilence more deadly to the state than any other. And in the previous sentence, he refers to the locust um, in, in, the, in the apocalypse. So yes. again, you can see uh, liberty of conscience. Well, you know, all of us were, you know, you're you free to think whatever you want. It's a free country, right? Uh, not exactly. Well, I, I always use the example, uh, 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 is there freedom of conscience with regard to mathematics? Is there freedom of conscience with regard to engineering? Civil engineering, for example, or medicine? Is there, are there not dogmas in these matters? Are there not mathematical principles? Are there not uh, uh, principles that are guaranteed by the state and required by the state in the education of, of doctors and of engineers? If you, could you say, I want freedom of conscience to build the bridge the way I want, with glue or something like that, or, or with bubble gum, and that, that it should hold up, uh, have no fear? Is, is there a freedom of conscience there? Uh, Clearly not. Absolutely not. Uh, in everything important, there is no freedom of conscience, but there is a dogma. That is the dogma of natural truths that have been discovered. Uh, physics uh, does does the uh, does Boeing have freedom of conscience in the design of an aircraft, or is it not bound to all of the physics of aeronautics? See, so. The most important knowledge that human beings have is the knowledge of God and how to get to God, how to go to heaven. And of all the things that should be dogmatic and should be established and, and protected by the state, it should be religion and the true religion. So to, to say that there should be freedom of conscience in what is most important to man has no sense at all. There, as if there is... It is to say that there is no possible objectivity in matters of religion, which is also nonsense, because even in natural religion there is objectivity. You can, through reason, uh, um, know God, 
as as Vatican the first Vatican Council said it, it's part of uh, the teaching of the church that you can prove the existence of God it's in St Paul through reason you can reason to God's uh, attributes as St Thomas does in the in the first part of the summa there are there are clearly objective truths concerning even natural religion and there are objective truths concerning supernatural religion which is the catholic faith and and uh, to say that there should be a freedom of conscience with regard to religion is to, you know, should we be uh, uh, f- free to, uh, uh, you know, take whatever drugs we want? <laughs> uh, if a doctor prescribes the wrong thing, isn't he sued for malpractice? Uh, why do we restrict it to religion? <laughs> why do we say that... <laughs> Uh, that there there is a freedom of conscience with regard to matters of religion, and just the idea, the modern idea of being politically correct, is that not a, a dogmatism? That you can, we can only think and say those things that, that are politically correct, and uh, and if uh, if some politician has a slip of the tongue and says something that is not politically correct, he's destroyed, he's burned at the stake. Because he had a slip of the tongue. Remember what happened to that poor lady that uh, had a television show. <laughs> what was her name? The cook, the the uh, uh, chef. Oh, uh, uh, I forget her name, but who the, had the, the television the, show the, the, the and lady. admitted that I, I, in I, I, her, her, her past name. she once right. used the N word. Uh, you know that a uh, few times she used the N word in her past. Well, then she was she was burned for that. I know where's her where's her freedom of speech, right? <laughs> you know, it, it it is even the very idea that there should be freedom of conscience is itself a dogma. Well, the I human think mind the, cannot escape dogmas. That is itself I think that's, a dogma. That's the point you're making, Your Excellency. Is this idea of removing theology from the hard sciences that that revelation is not a source of truth that you can't use scripture as as a means of argument because religion is reduced to a sentiment, to taste. Mm-hmm. Uh, morality yeah. is a sense of taste. It's a, it's a sentiment. And so the rules that you're talking about of mathematics, of engineering, well, they don't apply to theology because theology is not a science. Theology is right. just a sentiment, it's a feeling. Religion is just a feeling. Whereas yes, prior to and, science, and, at any university, theology was the queen of all sciences. Yes, it was the queen of all sciences. Uh, and everybody had in Catholic universities... And that was true in every university in the Middle, in the Middle Ages. Had, had to take theology. If you went to Catholic University, even as as you know, the 1930s, 40s, even 50s, you had to take Catholic theology. It was part of the the program. You even if you were in for mathematics or anything else, you had to take courses in Catholic theology uh, uh, because it is the most objective of all sciences because it comes from God. It is the most true, it is the most certain, and it is the most necessary. Everything else will pass away. Every bridge that human beings build will one day fall down. They will collapse, well, or they will be torn down. <laughs> well, and I suppose the nice thing about theology is the science agency is you don't always have to keep updated on the latest uh, changes, because <laughs> theology doesn't change. Um, it's just, it's whatever it is. So if you, if you want to study something stable, that, that's that. Um, yeah. Paragraph 15 addresses false freedom of publication. Uh, again, uh, His Holiness starts in, by saying, here we must include that harmful and never sufficiently denounced freedom to publish any writings, whatever, and disseminate them to the people, which some dare to demand and promote with so great a clamor. And the, and the last sentence of the paragraph reads, is there any sane man who would say poison ought to be distributed? sold publicly, stored, and even drunk because some antidote is available and those who, who use it may be snatched from death again and again. Again, we see the theme, Your Excellency, of His Holiness taking an abstract intellectual idea, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and giving us a real world um, scenario. And here he's talking about, well, you should give out poison because you, know, you, can, you, can, be, you can be saved any time. Yes, or be infected by Ebola. See, because you can go to the hospital and most likely get fixed up. 
You see, uh, the and, and you know that's not while that may be true, and and it's absurd, of course. Uh, but while you might get fixed up, to get fixed up from a false idea is extremely difficult. Once bad ideas get lodged in your brain, it's extremely difficult to get them out. Uh, the uh, it, it's uh, why people would think that the the spreading of of just any ideas at all would be good is an insanity. Well, again, medicine should <laughs> should we permit permit all sorts of quackery to to be distributed to medical students? Uh, you know, all, like witchcraft medicine should that be distributed? Yeah, what about people who want to bleed people? I mean, you know, we should yeah. give them freedom of speech to talk about you know, that method of healing. Yes. And leeches and, and, or <laughs> other, other, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's so much error that is possible, uh, that, that if we to, were to, um, to and uh, liberalize error completely, uh, the world would, would literally fall down. I mean, it would, uh, uh, the 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 state in each state of the of the United States uh, controls the higher education so that you can't get an engineering degree or or some other degree unless you meet certain standards. You know, there's the medical boards and and the the, uh, the lawyers, et cetera. They have to take their boards and their their examinations that are regulated by the state. And and you are not free to give out a degree in any of those things unless you are approved by the state. And they they approve the orthodoxy of what you learn because it's an insanity to, <laughs> to promote and 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 permit false teachings, false doctrines in uh, in anything at all, but particularly in those things that regard the health of human beings, even the natural health and safety of human beings. It's an insanity. It's a lunacy. But under, everyone knows it's a lunacy. But underneath is that idea that religion really doesn't matter. Religion is something for your own little world in your house. And it, this idea strips the, the society of religion because it confines it to your house. So it takes it out of schools. It takes it out of the, out of the courtroom and, and uh, puts in divorce and, and other things. And now we see uh, sodomitic marriages. And we'll see worse things after that. Uh, it, it uh, once you take man off the the uh, up from, away from the objectivity of of truths of religion, you are you are just it's a sinking moral ship. Any well, and that, the, the future is, is is a fearful thing. Well, and that can bring us back to Charlie Hebdo, your expertise. You'd like, I, I think, as Americans, we really don't have any basis of comparison for a publication i mean i don't I can't even use the word publication for the absolute filth that something like that represents which is i should say quite garden variety here it's the sort of thing that you'd pass i i, I spoke with my attorney here we were talking about some other matters and i asked him you know what charlie hebdo and he would play these as well you know um back uh, when i was in college in the 70s uh, you know it would be passed around you know, someone got it and everyone, everyone, uh, everyone read it. He said the way I would imagine that American colleges passed around mad magazines. And I told him, I said, well, no one passes around magazines anymore because it's all digital. But yes, take us back 20, 25 years ago. And he said that's the, the role it played. It was something that, that made fun of things and people took it at that level. Well, people don't really have in America, we don't have anything that's a, a, as outrageous as Charlie Hebdo that's sold in the newsstand with anything no. other than let's say plastic wrap or brown paper or something on it and mm -hmm. and so uh, any americans i heard there were various marches and in, in liberal strongholds in austin texas had its own uh je suis charlie uh uh march and uh, it was a really unfortunate not only because you know they thought they were seeking for free speech but also ultimately the necessary consequence of quote standing up for quote unquote free speech means that you have to stand up for the rights of child molesters and anything mm -hmm. that even the most, uh, you know, loving liberal would consider abhorrent, according to their intellectual construct, they have to stand up for it because they have no authority or no principles by which to deny that stuff. Yes, I agree. 
uh, and it's in our Constitution, freedom of speech. Something that came close a number of years ago was an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum of a picture of the Virgin Mary to which elephant dung had been stuck by the artist. Mm. Uh, and that was defended as freedom of speech. And indeed it is. See, if there's freedom of speech, how can, how can you put any, any leash upon it? Otherwise, it's not freedom. That means it, it, it is in, there's censorship. If you do one act of censorship, then you don't have freedom of speech. You have freedom of some speech. And that means there are certain dogmas of state uh, which limit your freedom. And once you get into that area, then you, you admit essentially what Gregory the Sixteenth is saying, that it's an insanity to have freedom of speech because it, it is to uh, put poison all over the world. Uh, so uh, even um, uh, Mr. B, Bergoglio, he said uh, that, well, freedom of speech has certain limits. <laughs> well, then it's not freedom of speech. If you're on a leash, you're on a leash. Right. And, well, and, and, and a, it, it blows up in their faces. Well, and His Holiness has a remedy for these ideas in, in paragraph 16. Uh, he says, uh, Clement XIII says in an encyclical letter about the banning of bad books, quote, as much as the matter itself demands and must exterminate the deadly poison of so many books, for never will the material for error be withdrawn unless the criminal sources of depravity of depravity perish in flames. Boy, that's, uh, that's uh, some tough words to, to hear. And you can tell this is an encyclical from, from pre-Vatican II because His Holiness quotes someone other than himself uh, or Vatican yes. II. Here. Yes, <laughs> He's Vatican II or John XXIII, that there is a world... <laughs> and all of the Vatican II stuff. There is no world before Vatican II. It's always Paul the right. It's always uh, it's somebody. Well, of course, they can't find anybody to support what they say. So, except those those. Uh, right, there's an iron curtain that's dropped in 1958. So <laughs> you see the post 1958 encyclicals. You can't yes. mention anybody because you can't find anything to support it. Right, as you say. Yes, far from supporting it, it condemns it. <laughs> Um, you, you, you mentioned the, the courtroom, uh, your excellency, and I, I can't help but think about, um, uh, paragraph 16, 17, where all authority comes from God is that again, there's this divorce. You, you alluded to the scheme, uh, in our introductory episode, you talked about, you know, the scheme of the papacy that, that even the, the Novus Ordo sect care, you know, is able to avail itself of the scheme of legitimacy that had come from all of these, these great popes. But yeah. by divorcing religion from public life and, and putting it into a box, not just in your home, but in your home on Sundays, I mean, mm -hmm. not, not, it's not during the week. I mean, certainly not when we're associating with our friends, not when we're watching TV, not when we're out, you know, associating and you know, listening to rock music. That, that's all, that's not what we're talking about. We're only talking about on Sunday. That it doesn't change the metaphysics of, of our reality that, you know, when a judge hands down a decision, the judge is doing so uh, from, from God's authority. I think you, you alluded to this in, in a sermon mm -hmm. some time back that you, you, can, you can say what you want about religion. It doesn't change the fact that the superstructures of religion are still in place and are being used by the state. They just, mm -hmm. they just pretend that religion has nothing to do with it, but it's all linked together. Yes, the upcoming decision by the Supreme Court concerning sodomitic marriages. What do those justices have to say about marriage? What, what is their authority to talk about marriage? Did they invent marriage? Does the Constitution talk about marriage? What, what, does the, what do they have to say about it? I mean, it is not the, if they deny God, if they deny that their, their authority comes from God and that there is an eternal law which is expressed in what we call the natural law, and that natural law excludes, obviously, sodomitic marriage because it's contrary to nature. If they do not admit that, they become, how many of them, seven absurd individuals that are talking through their hats. You know, if if they 
they don't even, how can they define marriage? <laughs> what, who are they to define marriage? Do they have degrees in matrimony or something? I mean, who are these people to decide this? Whether two people can live in, in matrimony. It, it is, if you deny that link of the state to the authority of God, then the state just becomes a bully. Then it just becomes a bunch of people who have more power and, and keys to a jail cell than uh, that you don't have. See, that you fear the state. These are just a bunch of people who managed to get elected and put into place and the reason that you are obeying them is because they have the keys to the jail cell. There, and, and that is just a, a bully state that will never last very long. It, it will be subject to all sorts of convulsions uh, because there is no linkage to the authority of God. We're coming towards the end of the encyclical, Your Excellency, and I, I want to take the opportunity to remind our listeners that you are listening to Popes Against the Modern Errors, Episode 1 on Mirari Vos. I'm Stephen Heiner, uh, along with His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn, Most Holy Trinity Seminary in Brooksville, Florida. Um, Popes Against the Modern Errors is a production of the Restoration Radio Network. All rights are reserved, and any duplication without explicit written permission is forbidden. Permission can usually be very easily obtained by writing to mail, M-A-I-L, at truerestoration.org. Your Excellency, towards the end of the encyclical, in paragraph 23, His Holiness is asking for help from the princes. And I I have some mixed emotions as I, I read this, and I'll, I'll read it in, in toto because it's, it's worth reading. But as I read it, I wonder, is this something that from our perspective, from modern times, I feel it would be something that, that the Pope would, would have to say because that's what he's obliged to do. But with, with the, the state of the world, there would be no hope that any but a few would, would listen. But at this time in 1832, I suppose there was still some real practical hope that some, a paragraph like this might touch the heart of a prince. But how, you know, what a, what a burden and what an important duty uh, those who govern us have he says, may our dear sons in Christ, the princes, support these our desires for the welfare of church and state with their resources and authority. May they understand that they receive their authority not only for the government of the world, but especially for the defense of the church. They should diligently consider that whatever work they do for the welfare of the church accrues to their rule and peace. Indeed, let them persuade themselves that they owe more to the cause of the faith than to their kingdom. Let them consider it something very great for themselves, as we say with Pope St. Leo, if in addition to their royal diadem, the crown of faith may be added. Placed as if they were parents and teachers of the people, they will bring them true peace and tranquility if they take special care that religion and piety remain safe. God, after all, calls himself King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I mean, that's, that's a catechism right there, Your Excellency. Yes. Yes, these are very well-crafted documents that are loaded with wonderful things, and they should be studied, they should be read again and again, and are very timely for our world. And he ends, uh, again, not just the, as you say, the word craft, but even the time of release. So uh, His Holiness uh, put this out uh, from St. Mary Major, so a Basilica of Our Lady, on the 15th of August. So he ends with an appeal to Our Lady uh, that, that she may, may crown our efforts and, and may, may guide us through this time. So again, never forgetting um, Our Lady's role uh, within, within our mission and, and within what we have to say. And that brings us to the end of Mirari Vos, Your Excellency. Is there anything else that you'd, you'd like to, to talk about that we haven't, we haven't touched? I know I didn't hit every single paragraph. But is there anything else you'd like to speak about? No, I think that's, uh, he is, one of uh, a long line of pontiffs who are saying the same thing. And that's why the religious liberty document of Vatican II is such a slap in the face to Catholic magisterium. I mean, there's, I mean, it would have been sufficient that one pontiff say it, but all of these pontiffs of recent times and before Vatican II 
are saying the same thing. Uh, Leo the Thirteenth will say the same thing in, in Libertas Praestantissimum and other documents. Pius X will say the same thing. Pius IX will say the same thing. Leo the Twelfth said the same thing. Uh, Pius XI will say the same thing in in uh, uh, the uh, encyclical on Christ the King, and and so will Pius XII. Uh, it, you know, this is a chorus of great popes. Uh, we had a series of great popes there, and this is a chorus uh, saying all the same things. And so Vatican II, uh, to to say what it did was so bold uh, in proclaiming uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion that false religions should be able to propagate themselves and ordain clergy and establish uh, you know, all, all of the aspects of religion. It's all in there. Uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, authored by uh, John Courtney Murray, who extolled the American uh, model uh, of a free church and a free state. Uh, uh, that, it's, it's as old as uh, it was the French sounds, Revolution. Sounds like, it sounds like some build water to me. Well, as a matter of fact, the Bishop of Charleston in the 1830s, Charleston, South Carolina, wrote a book called "The Free Church and a Free State." Yes. So that this liberal Catholicism goes way back. Uh, it, it is the bilge water in the bottom of the ship, and in Vatican II, the bilge water came right up to the top, <clears throat> together with rats. And of various other things, vermin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, you're, you you say that uh, you don't count them till Christmas, and we're after Christmas now. So I want to ask you how things are going uh, at the seminary. Uh, they're going well. Uh, we have, uh, as, as I uh, said before, and other shows, uh, a very good group of seminarians. Uh, they come from many different lands. Uh, and um, we have a good showing for next year. Uh, I think we will uh, have a, a, another full house next year. Um, we have lost so far only two of our seminarians in this academic year, which is quite normal. Uh, and um, so, uh, yes, uh, we're actually pressed for space. I mean, if I took everyone that really wanted to get in here, I would have to build about another 10 rooms. Well, and that's and why I, we need right donations. now. I cannot do that. So, uh, and did you, uh, when you were in, uh, and perhaps in another episode, we might we might speak about your your trip to to Europe. But uh, did you? Were there any seminarians that needed to be interviewed while you were over there? Or should we expect yes, any more? Yes, I did interview a, a a German seminarian in Munich, and uh, he made a good impression on me. And uh, he hopes to enter next fall. Uh, and um, so that would give us two German seminarians, which is uh, new for us in a way. Uh, you know, Germany has not been uh, an active place for us. And uh, uh, so you're I'm saying very... if the German invasion, you would welcome your excellency? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, so I uh, now I'm going to go to England four times a year, uh, and uh, to take care of them in England. And I'm arranging that other priests go in as well. So. I'll have a certain presence in Europe this year, at least, and probably from now on. Uh, and uh, I'll visit other places in Europe and uh, try to promote what we're doing over there. Well, as as an American living in Europe, your Excellency, we're, we're happy to have you. So uh, we'll we'll look forward well, to your visit. Well, since you're in that. Paris, you know it would be hard for me to uh, skip over Paris when I'm over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, as as I said, you're 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 always welcome, and I'm sure the the faithful in England, who up to this point have have only had one non unicum mass a month, will certainly be happy to now, uh, in addition to what they already have, be be uh, be able to avail themselves of of more masses. So, um, yes. that that's good. Uh, yes. And and I heard that you had some some um, unicum mass goers uh, take some stock uh, after listening to your your non-Unicum uh, conference there in London. Yes, I think uh, I did convince some people, uh, uh, actually convinced them. Others I gave, uh, I gave something to think about. and um, But it was definitely successful, uh, and uh, uh, we certainly have the wherewithal to begin a central London mass center on a monthly basis. 
Well, I think that's, that's great news. And again, if you'd like to hear more about those sorts of things, His Excellency covers his visits, as well as, as you heard, he wrote something about Charlie Hebdo. There's no reason for you not to get the seminary newsletter. Uh, you can get that by sending the donation, um, as we say, of at least $75, but preferably more. Um, you can send that to Most Holy Trinity Seminary, 1000 Spring Lake Highway, uh, Brooksville, Florida. The RCC is at 34602. Yes. I don't have it right in front of me. Okay, good. 34602. Um, the RCC, as always, thanks for your time, and we look forward to our next episode and more encyclicals. If you have questions for His Excellency, you can write to modernerrors at truerestoration.org. And those questions will be forwarded directly to him, and we can answer those on future episodes. Thanks so much, Rex. All right. Thank you for listening. Well, as always, we want to remind you that here at the Restoration Radio Network, this show to be informative, helpful, and in any way beneficial to you and to your faith, that you please consider sending a note of thanks to the clergy like Bishop Sanborn, who helped make our network worthwhile. Remember that above and beyond material contributions, the most important donation you can make to our work here is prayer. Please think of offering a mass, a rosary, or even a simple ave for our work the next time that you pray. This program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovusOrdoWatch.org.